So first of all, thank you everyone for being here. It's a great opportunity. We have such great panelists today here. A really good mix of what's happening in emerging markets uh, from big incumbents to companies that are doing really innovative things in different markets in, in Africa, LATAM. So uh, very fortunate to be here. Um, so just giving a quick introduction. So first, uh, Ken here, CEO and founder of Moon. Uh, based in New York, creating a Bitcoin challenger bank. Um, uh, it's a banking as a service platform specifically focused on providing consumers Visa credit cards to spend crypto without KYC. So very interesting. Uh, then we have Daniel, COO of Mercado Libre, a public company in the New York Stock Exchange, the biggest marketplace in the LATAM and probably one of the biggest companies in LATAM, just to make it easier. Um, it's like an Amazon meets PayPal, uh, been around for more than 20 years. Then we have uh, here Chris, CEO and founder of FondBank, a company in Africa that is com can convert any prepaid card, uh, SIM card, into uh, global, uh, a debit card um, for emerging markets. And then we have Camila. Camila was a journalist for eight years in Bloomberg. Um, she covered FX and emerging markets and wrote one of the first books on the history on Ethereum, which is now soon going to become a movie. I don't know if that's a spoiler, but congrat congratulations on that. And she's also the founder of Defiant, which is a content platform focused in fintech. And then we have uh, Borja, CBO and founder of Lemon Cash, 25-year-old, uh, uh, been in Bitcoin since he's 14, uh, building Lemon, a crypto bank in Argentina, in Latin America, uh, with more than 1 million users. Um, and yeah, just launched in Brazil, so also very exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, guys, first question. Um, in any revolution, uh, there's, there's different roles, right? There's uh, the ones building the rails, the ones uh, that are the dreamers, um, and uh, the ones helping to build a critical mass. So my first question would be, what, what roles are you guys playing? Um, and also uh, an opportunity to introduce some of the products that you're doing. Like what role are you playing in, in this revolution? So uh, at Moon, uh, what we're doing, we, we offer both B2C and B2B products. Uh, we focus on off-ramps. So right now our consumer-facing product allows consumers to spend their crypto uh, anywhere Visa is accepted without having to go through a KYC process. Obviously this is huge for uh, the Bitcoin and broader crypto communities, privacy being very important, but also uh, in, in the developing world, a lot of people lack the necessary documentation to access financial services, right? So we offer that directly to consumers and now on the banking as a service side of our platform, we're enabling other uh, crypto companies and fintechs to uh, also have similar functionality. So, uh, so we're really playing the role of the off-ramp, really taking the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem and allowing people to use it in the real world because at the end of the day, you, you have to like buy food, right? So uh, that's us. I'll take a stab on, on this one. Uh, I think we, we play uh, also a clear role here. Uh, so we were the dreamers maybe 23 years ago. Uh, I'm a little older than my friend Borja. Um, but right now we are the incumbents. Uh, so last year we had like a 140 million users in the region out of a 600 million total population of the region. So we're definitely the incumbents. Uh, and uh, we launched, timidly launched, uh, buy, hold and sell capabilities in Brazil, or one of the operations, uh, and we got a million users in, in a little bit more than a month, uh, which was incredible. But at the same time, um, it made us really, really interested in the space uh, and, and uh, being able, as an incumbent, and uh, to help get critical mass of many of you guys, probably, that are starting companies or trying to innovate. But at the same time, you work in a very closed community. Uh, and I've been there uh, a couple of decades ago, so uh, I, I think that it's very hard to do something alone. Uh, crypto and the rest of the world will, will coexist for decades, probably, uh, and we need to, to get critical mass. Uh, 
there is a risk of, of becoming, becoming isolated of the rest of the world. So I think we, we're going to play that role and uh, hope we can play that role decently. What's your take, Borja, um, having uh, the other side of the, of the table? Uh, and you and, and Daniel, you combine the same market. Uh, how do you guys work together in this ecosystem? Well, um, I think that a Mercado Libre, for example, actually joining the crypto space is really, really good um, because the, the crypto offering that, that big incumbents like them uh, do um, are not the best, not the most innovative, of course, because they are publicly listed companies and so on, and they have lots of, of limits on the things that they can do. And that for us is a huge opportunity because actually when people want to level up on their experience, uh, they can migrate to solutions like Lemon. Like Lemon today gives you a bank account, a Visa debit card that gives you Bitcoin cash back. All of the cryptos that you hold in Lemon generate yield. We're plugged into DeFi. You can go from pesos to UST on Anchor protocol in one click. Um, so for us, it's super important for Mercado Libre and so on to join the crypto space because um, it validates crypto for a lot of people. Uh, there's uh, still a big chunk of the population that is still not in crypto and through companies like Mercado Libre they can actually join uh, and say, ah, this is not as crazy as it sounds, like Mercado Libre is doing it. I, I could just rather buy a, a, as well. Um, and then once they start seeing the actual value of crypto, uh, I think that, Danny, that, that then we actually start to getting and accruing a lot of value because again it's a big market that is jumping into crypto and then they want something, um, I don't know if better, but let, let's say a more robust experience and they can migrate. So, so it's an interesting thing, right? We have uh, companies trying to defend uh, their customers and also serve their customers that already have big volumes and customers that are used to other kind of services. Um, and then we have companies that are bringing new customers to the ecosystem. Um, so of course different uh, strategies probably and different approaches. Um, so m maybe a follow-up question on that and maybe Chris if you, if you want to, to, to answer that is um, wh why do customers need crypto? What's like if I need to send money from someone from me to a friend for instance like why don't I just use Venmo? Like what, what's really uh, what's some, something that people need to understand in emerging markets and really makes a difference and a reason why a company like uh, Mercado Libre uh, will be in, would be interested in getting uh, crypto in their products, considering all of the different uh, risks that that can bring. It's a great, great question. Um, one one analogy I like to give is: imagine that if each uh, state in the U.S. was a different country and had a different banking system, different telecommunication system, and that uh, when you landed in Boston to come to this conference, there was a 50% chance that your, none of your credit cards or debit cards would work. Well, that's how it is for many people across the emerging world when they try to participate in the global digital economy. And, and so this is where things like uh, crypto come into, uh, come into to play as this sort of thread um, that allows all these different financial systems. And you know we see ourselves as a type of on-ramp where we take people from the uh, cash-based, mobile-first economies and enable them to jump into to crypto. And in many ways, in, it, just like uh, many of these economies, they leapfrog from telecommunications going from no phone, leapfrogging landline into wireless, you're going to see a similar type of adoption uh, going into D DeFi. Because at the end of the day, um, having a stable coin and a software wallet available on a mobile phone uh, with these type of on-ramps that we can afford, whether it's DeFi or traditional financial services, um, that's the best and maybe the only financial solution that they ever need. You know, it's costly to, to open up a bank branch. What are you gonna give away toasters to acquire customers across the, the world? But if, it, but if you wanna get to the next five billion people and make sure that they're included, it's gonna look something like what we're doing in crypto today. Quick, quick, very quick comment on just building on, on, on Chris's comment. The, the number one reason uh, the, the, of crypto adoption in Latin America is inflation hedging. So there is a correlation uh, when you see weaker currencies uh, of crypto adoption. So um, 
they are not dreamers, they are not ideological, they would just live in region with weaker currencies. Yeah, and, and that was the next point I want to t touch in. Like, um, here in the US, everyone is panicking because of the 8%, 8.5% inflation. Uh, in Argentina, we have around, uh, I would say, almost 100% inflation, not officially, but I would say it's we more like 100 We have 8% a month. So uh, uh, next time you're complaining about yeah. your 8% inflation, remember us. Usually, in many emerging markets, it's volatility down with no chance of going up. So, so yeah, I mean, that's uh, probably one of the biggest reasons on, 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 on adoption. And actually, tapping into adoption, Camila, I would love to see, like, what is your perspective, given that uh, you're talking to so many companies that are uh, writing about new innovation. You're writing about so many companies doing innovation. Uh, what, what do you think is... Uh, like a really strong point in adoption in emerging market. Is it around like, uh, like I would think it's stable coins because we're talking about inflation as one of the main reasons, but what other reasons uh, do people have in emerging markets to get into crypto and what are you seeing in, in, in general uh, in different markets? So I, I was just uh, looking at a study about uh, crypto adoption in emerging markets. No, global crypto adoption. And the first eight countries in the list were from emerging markets. So topping the US, Canada, develop, developed nations, crypto adoption is leading in emerging markets. And it's extremely correlated with how fast uh, currencies depreciate, um, how much people will use crypto. So uh, countries that have had really fast uh, depreciation of their currencies, like Vietnam was the country with the most adoption and it's, it's Vietnam. currency, Vietnam. Yeah, it's the country with the most crypto adoption. Um, and it suffered a, a, a big hit to its currency. And, and same with like Ukraine, for example, and, and other countries, uh, Philippines, uh, with unstable currencies. So definitely um, uh, the protection against uh, inflation um, and, and currency volatility is the main driver uh, in emerging countries. Um, currency controls uh, are a big uh, driver towards uh, crypto. So it's, it's very different from what's driving adoption in developed nations. In developed nations, you see adoption being driven in, in, the, in the past year or so, being driven by institutional adoption. So uh, big investment firms getting into crypto, offering Bitcoin products. Um, in emerging nations, it's more grassroots driven. Uh, people kind of actually go into crypto because they, they need it as, as a store of value, uh, because their, their savings are being eroded right, by the depreciation of their currency. So it's a very interesting dichotomy. Like when, when you look at um, the, the volumes, the, the, the sizes of the transactions, in developed countries, the, the size of transactions are much higher because, yeah, uh, adoption is being driven by institutions. But in emerging markets, transaction sizes are a lot smaller because it's actually retail, like yeah. individual uh, people who are, are, are seeking crypto. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and I would love to double click on that and uh, actually compare a little bit LATAM, maybe even South Asia with Africa. Uh, like how are different business models thriving in dif different regions according to the behavior of the consumer? Like for instance, uh, in Africa, I don't know, in the world, there's like 8 billion um, SIM cards, no, uh, approximately. So, well, what's can, can you explain a little bit more? But I don't know if uh, er, everyone understands exactly the innovation and what you're doing. So, what we've done is uh, we've been able to, to leverage this sort of existing uh, cash-in network of topping up your mobile phone, right? If you can prepay or charge your your mobile phone, uh, one of our investors, his thesis for us was that he'd. Uh, backpack across sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and certain parts of Southeast Asia, and that probably the only thing as ubiquitous as being able to recharge your, your mobile phone at any sort of corner store or agent was maybe buying a Coca-Cola. And so what we've done at PhoneBank is enable a user to extract that value that might be uh, that exists on their prepaid mobile SIM. So think about it as like a prepaid debit card. but tokenize that on a public blockchain and make it tradable like a commodity into currency or even traditional financial services. We're actually partnered with Visa, MasterCard, and even have an investment from Western Union. Um, but, but allowing the, the 
bottom of the pyramid in terms of financial inclusion um, uh, and aligning that with probably the most uh, available access point in the world, and that's being able to recharge your, your phone. But you know, what that enables us to do then is um, drive micro transactions, call it the 10 to $15 range. And, and if you think about it, like while there's a lot of great off-ramp solutions, there's not a lot of good on-ramp solutions for emerging markets. And as we, you know, we talk about NFTs or gaming or anything in digital economy, well, you know, sure there's a, you know, a, a billion or two people in the developed world, but what about the five billion people in the rest of the world? They wanna play video games too or buy things online uh, watch Netflix, et cetera, we enable this, and I would describe it as a type of reverse remittance to the rest of the world. Amazing. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, time, um, who's just someone who's checking? Okay, cool. Because I could be talking about this all day, uh, so I just don't want to get carried away. But uh, mention, mentioning on-ramp and off-ramp, uh, just to be clear, on-ramp is how do you get into the crypto world, off-ramp is how do you get out of, uh, or actually use that, that money that you have in, in the crypto world, uh, let's call it like that. Um, so on that, I think it's very interesting uh, what Ken, for instance, is doing at Moon. Um, could you explain a little bit more about uh, how are you making the, the, that transition easier for the customer, uh, even the unbanked ones in this uh, emerging market? Yes, so, so there are a few sides to that. Um, one specifically in emerging markets, uh, there's a lot of people who don't have documentation, right? So. Um, you know, maybe you're born in a small village, you don't have a birth certificate, therefore now you can't open up a bank account. Um, so, so what are you gonna do, right? They're really stuck in the, in the cash economy. So by offering uh, cards that don't require KYC to onboard uh, to financial services, now you can make an e-commerce payment, right? Which we all take for granted, wow, that, that's just a simple thing we do every day, we shop on Amazon. But for some people, they're just like completely excluded from that, they don't, they don't have that option. Um, so, uh, so on the other side of things, what we're doing is that, uh, you know, a lot of times in the developing world, um, you know, we have all these crypto companies, right? They're offering wallets, and these wallets are across, say, 154 countries. And you want to say, hey, let me, let me get a card for all of my customers, right? Um, and it's, you can't actually do that. It's just not possible today, right? Um, you have to go country by country and do a partnership in every single country in order to get a Visa card for customers within that country. And it's gonna take you 10 years to do that in a region, for example. So what we're doing is uh, we're allowing uh, Bitcoin and crypto companies to access the Visa network for off-ramps, specifically focused in the developing world, make it really simple. So uh, a company that exists in, you know, maybe they're regional, like all of Africa, all of Latin America, all of Southeast Asia, getting them access to the Visa network so that all their customers with one API integration can now get access to that, right? So, uh, so we're doing a lot of interesting things there um, and, and also taking a little bit greater risk, whereas a lot of banks that would typically issue these cards to companies, um, they, they, you know, you try to explain to them what you're trying to do with Bitcoin and they don't understand at all what you're talking about. They're scared, they don't want to talk to you. Um, where we're going head first and focusing specifically on helping Bitcoin companies um, get that real, real world use case of spending. So a lot of different ways to bring customers into the ecosystem. Uh, I, I really liked uh, Lemon Cash when I first heard about you guys. Uh, how were you uh, creating this um, ecosystem in San Martin de los Andes, a beautiful place in, in the Andes in Argentina, and how they, were they creating their MVP on, on that place? Um, people using crypto for everything, for everything uh, from going to the supermarket, uh, buying a banana, whatever. Uh, we love bananas here in MIT. I don't know if you noticed, we have a room full of them. Uh, but uh, Lemon, uh, Borja, can you explain a little bit more about uh, how, what, what are some of those strategies, like uh, maybe talk a little bit about the Lemonator, the point of, uh, of sale, and all of the different ways you have to bring adoption. And, and then uh, on adoption, I would love to have the, the other side, uh, Mercado Libre, um, which is probably also trying to focus on uh, how to maintain the users and also, uh, of course, protect uh, the users that you already have. You're also a public company, um, you know, uh, it's very big, uh, less flexibility. So uh, I would love to have that contrast here. I think it's super interesting. So, Borja. Yeah, yeah so 
um, essentially what uh, Andrew was talking about is, um, what we think about is, we, we truly believe that crypto is the future, right? Uh, of money, basically, and the internet. That's Web3, internet and money, and it's all crypto. Um, but the truth is that crypto is actually not mainstream until people replace their bank with a crypto bank. Then in the future, it will just be a bank. But I mean, like, people need to live on crypto for crypto to actually be mainstream. And again, crypto is truly mainstream once that all of you guys here, instead of having JP Morgan, have like Lemon, for example, um, which you will. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so uh, what Andrew was talking about is like, how can we make it possible? So right now in Lemon, like I told you before, we have lots of traditional financial services that we make them be much better with crypto, like for example, yielding. Again, uh, a month ago we listed UST on Anchor Protocol, and people go from pesos to anchor in a click, and it's insane. We had an all-time high that day. Um, and we tried many things, and one of the things we actually tried was uh, to create a crypto city. So we went to this town uh, where we lived for a year, and it's actually where we started. And we worked, our office was the garage of the house. And um, basically what ended up happening is that it's a 40,000 people town uh, in the Patagonia, which is now called the Patagonia Crypto Valley. Uh, and we basically acquired all the merchants, and today like 90% of the town has the lemon card and goes to every shop and pays in crypto. So what we wanted to, to see if, if, uh, if we could actually create a place where that happened, where people replaced their bank with a crypto bank. Uh, and it did. And right now we've, uh, we've got, uh, we've, we've discontinued merchants for Lemon as a company, but we still have merchants in the Crypto Valley. Um, and it's completely insane to see how the adoption um, has, uh, let's say, evolutioned. Uh, and this is a quick example to finish. When we started, people and merchants um, would, of course, want to get pesos as a payment. Then we would, we would uh, talk with them about crypto and so on. And, and slowly what we saw was that merchants, we gave them a POS and the Lemonator was actually a liquidator, but it was basically a, a POS that as soon as you uh, got the payment, it got converted into crypto. So merchants could uh, charge your, it was a POS, you could charge, I could charge your uh, debit or credit card, but I would get uh, crypto instead of fiat as a merchant. Um, so what ended up happening is that at first merchants only received fiat. Then we started seeing that merchants would actually buy crypto, and then it got, like today, it's in the complete other extreme where you go in this town and most of the places where you go, you are gonna, when you pay, the person is probably asking you to uh, pay in USDT or any stable coin or actually even Ethereum, for example. We actually have a, a, a really famous example that we always say that this is a sandwich shop which the guy became from like no coiner to completely complete Ethereum crazy fanboy. Uh, and today it's like you go, you get a sandwich there and the guy says to everybody, even if they don't have lemon or whatever, like, please send me Ethereum, uh, you know, like please pay in Ethereum. Um, so that's a little bit of, of, of what's going on. And, and again, I think that, um, that needs to happen. Like people need to replace their traditional financial service provider. It doesn't matter if it's payments uh, or acceptance as a merchant or as a consumer, but people need to replace that with a crypto offering. Can I add something? Yes, please. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I think crypto is the future uh, because simply because the, the system is better, the, the network upon which these uh, decentralized finance and Web3 applications are built. So blockchain technology is simply better than it where tra traditional finance is, is built. Uh, you know, protocols that are just not meant to transfer value uh, are being replaced with blockchains which are natively built uh, to do that, to transfer value in an efficient way, removing intermediaries. Um, but I do think that to get to a place where uh, everyone uh, is using crypto to its full advantage. I think you know uh, applications and companies like Lemon are a great kind of middle step, like a, a stepping stone toward that that future. But I think what's what's missing, especially in, in emerging markets and Latin America, 
is really kind of truly non-custodial solutions. So Lemon is, is still custodial, right? So I think that that's a great kind of first step. But I'd love to see in, in, in Latin America and in emerging uh, nations more, uh, more adoption of really kind of non-custodial wallets, of people kind of really taking control of their assets and of their information, taking control of their private keys. Yeah, and you say something, sorry, uh, you say removing intermediaries. And that's something that I'm curious, you know, when I think about a company like Mercado Libre, which is a plug-in so to so many big companies already and intermediaries you could think of, you know? So, like, w what is uh, the other, like, the, the other position? And you also, like, I can share my, you, you my, my ideas because on, in theory, uh, I completely agree with everyone. Um, in theory, communism works. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, not really. I know it's debatable. Uh, now, the, the, the reason why I'm mentioning that, uh, so I, I, I'll start with the, the, a little counterpoint about the last part, with the, 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 the last Camilla part, the custodial versus non-custodial wallets. Um, maybe there is a fraction or a percentage of the population that do one have control uh, of our own money, maybe I'm one of them. Um, but as, as Kami said before, uh, the vast majority, at least of our users, are not concerned. Uh, I'm just observing, I'm not uh, making a judgment of value. I'm just saying that the vast majority of our users, at least, uh, they want to be protected against inflation. They don't want to be stuck in the cash economy, which is the, the, the sad reality for, for lower classes. And, uh, and they are being basically scammed by the, the government. Uh, they, they need to have a way of protecting against that. Uh, the, the crypto system is definitely the better. Uh, and, but going back to, to, the, to the thing, I, I think we have all the time these uh, huge problems of people forgetting their credentials, are, are, are they counting on us, for example, to, to, to restore them. Uh, it would be very hard for us to say, you know, you lost your credential, you lost your money. Uh, I, I think it was your freedom and your responsibility. Uh, in my opinion, non-custodial wallets uh, are not going to be mainstream for a while. Uh, I'm just saying what I think it will happen. I, I would love people to be maybe more educated and experts, but this lower class, it's Sadly, also not the best educated people in technology and keeping your own credentials is, is also quite risky. Um, the banking system is broken in, in, in a lot of ways. Ironically, uh, if you live in a country like, like Argentina, you run the risk of the, of the bank stealing your money, but you, you're not running the risk of the bank losing your money or, or misplacing your money. Uh, <laughs> And in crypto, you, it, it ha can happen. Uh, so, um, so the usability part for, for us is, is, is very important. Uh, so to make it short, uh, it, I, I think we, we got here. I mean, we, we moved from a very small startup to a very large company, trying to always keep in mind what the users want. Uh, and I think they, they're not begging for a non-custodial wallet right now. They are begging for a way of protecting themselves against inflation. So on that, how are you innovating in Mercado Libre? To it's very easy. We're taking, uh, we're risk takers, actually. Uh, we're, we're going, we were the, the, the only and the first public company, large one, to actually allow users to buy, hold, and sell crypto. And of course, I cannot share many of the details, but we're go going to do a lot more things in the space. Uh, and uh, we're all the time talking to other companies and we are risk takers. Uh, and we are integrating in many cases uh, with, with great smaller crypto companies. So if any of you guys have a great idea for Latin America, just talk to me afterward uh, because we like to take risks uh, and we're willing to take risks and we're taking these this ones, but uh, we need to, in, in many cases, partner with, uh, with many of you. Chris. Yeah, I mean, one of the innovations that we've done is I would describe it as a pseudonymous custodial wallet and that we use the KYC SIM and, and number and we filter out a landline or um, uh, VoIP numbers and so we know definitively that it's a real human being that's creating a wallet with us and 
but we hold the, hold the keys, but we don't necessarily know who they, who they are other than the fact that they've gone through a compliance process with the, the carrier. And we found it a very smooth onboarding process in our markets with probably some of the same issues that you all face. So let's switch for a second, let's switch gears for a second, and um, let's talk about education and how do you get the, the people to understand what you're offering? Because I, I personally think that blockchain is nothing without the community. Like it just doesn't make any sense. So how, how do you, um, like maybe Camila, you, you can start with that one. Uh, how do you educate a consumer? How, what, what are smart ways to, uh, you know, getting people more involved or at least understand what, what they're doing when they get into crypto? And then on, on that, I would love to follow with you, Ken, and explain, like, you're also doing something pretty, uh, that sounds like a kind of illegal when you first think about it, maybe, you know, no KYC, you know, what, what, what is no KYC, what do you mean? Uh, and um, I, I love to ask you this question because I know that you get it a lot. Um, uh, but it's super interesting to hear how, uh, how you, um, you know, explain to the customer uh, how they, they can use all of this. Uh, so, Camila, uh, on education. So, when you asked about uh, what our roles were uh, in the beginning, I think, you know, the defiance role and, and even my role uh, in crypto is definitely education. Um, so, with the defiant, uh, we were the first uh, DeFi-focused uh, newsletter, and now it's a media company um, with not just a newsletter, but YouTube channel, podcast, and website with just like daily stories focusing on, on DeFi and Web3. And coming from, from Bloomberg, where I covered crypto from a distance, you know, I think kind of like mainstream media. Um, uh, covers crypto from this space of like looking down uh, at, at, at kind of the community and innovation. At the Defiant, I wanted to cover crypto and, and specifically DeFi and Web3 from within the community. And I think that's really important because we're about, uh, you know, getting really in the weeds, uh, getting in kind of the, the daily developments, kind of behind the curtains of, of what's happening. So we try to, to bring kind of that insider perspective of what's really happening in DeFi and Web3, but doing in a way that's uh, objective and unbiased, which is something that is often hard to find a, in crypto. In crypto, it's many times kind of investors who have their own podcasts and newsletters and, you know, where you can't really trust that they're giving you like a, an unbiased, um, you know, up in from, like a portrayal of, of things. We, we, we really try to take the same standards that I learned at Bloomberg and bring them into, uh, into crypto. So that's, that's our role. And then uh, with the Infinite Machine, uh, the, the book I wrote in Ethereum, um, I really tried to write a book where anyone could just pick it up without ever having uh, heard about crypto or blockchain. They could pick it up and just read a fun story about a group of dreamers who were following a crazy idea and face challenges like any startup does. Um, and through that fun story about Vitalik and you know his uh, his team, uh, learn about the potential, the incredible potential of, of this technology. Hopefully, you know when this gets turned into a movie, uh, this message can uh, reach a much broader audience uh, that way as well. So, hopefully, kind of we're bringing a little bit, uh, bringing this message and and uh, and you know, the, the news needed uh, to, to learn about this uh, to a broader audience. Um, but that's just one side. It's, it's, so you can like put all the, the podcast episodes out there and put all the YouTube shows and like all the tutorial guides. But if there's nobody searching uh, for that content, it doesn't matter. So it's like sometimes, a, a, lot, a lot of times in these panels, people ask like what's needed for crypto adoption and is it education? And sure, that's one side, but in the end, it's, it's having a, a strong a use cases. It's yeah. having kind of things that people can use and, and solve their problems with, and then they can go and, and find all this information and it'll be there because we, you know, we are producing it. But I also believe like, and, and this is in general, right? When you understand something, you get more into it and when you, realize that you can actually get, get value out of it and be good at it, uh, you understand more. It's like a positive flywheel. And 
I, I'm, I'm talking from my perspective. I work in a, in a DAO called Kraus House. We're trying to buy, actually buy an MBA team. And uh, one of the most important things is uh, that, that actually makes the DAO successful in our case is um, having people that actually vote and are engaged, right? And if people don't understand, they won't vote because they just can't take ownership on anything. Right, so that, that's another thing that I, I, I think is super important. And uh, Ken, uh, I, I, would, I do want to hear your, your vision on this, uh, like especially on the legal side, like everyone talks about regulation, uh, like how do you explain people that this is perfectly fine and like it, it works? Yeah, so, so we have two types of customers. Uh, one are uh, hardcore Bitcoiners, highly sophisticated people with non-custodial Lightning Network wallets and they, they love what we're doing and their eyes just bulge out of their heads when they hear that we don't have a KYC requirement, right? And it's not so much that uh, they, they're excluded from the financial system and this is the only way they can access things. This is an ideological thing. Uh, the other group of people who are really excited about us are folks that don't have access to the banking system and when they hear that uh, they don't need KYC to get access, their eyes also bulge out of their heads. Um, so, uh, so, so it's very powerful and, and what we've seen is that we, we have a lot of customers that um, have learned how to use Bitcoin just to gain access to our cards, which is really interesting because that's an incentive and I think it goes back to the point of just practical use cases. Someone's not going to learn anything about Bitcoin for the sake of learning Bitcoin. They're going to learn about Bitcoin because it allows them to do something that they need to do, right? Or because they have it on a cash bag already, no? Well, there you go. There's some incentive, right? Like yeah. that's very valuable. So, uh, and, and on the legal side, you know, you know, we had to do a lot of research on how to make all of this happen. But it's, I mean, I, I like telling people the no KYC thing, and they kind of eyes bulge out of their head. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, guys, I think we're a little short on time. Um, I'd love to open it up for the public, just to you know, for general Q and A. Um, so maybe we'll take uh, three questions. Uh, yes, first. Okay. Hello. Good evening, right here to the left, to where, the right. Where, where, where? Ah. So this is Fabian Vera. Uh, bienvenidos a Cambridge, eh, caballeros y damas. So question, digital banking license, what is your take and how that affects your uh, endeavors currently and in the near future? So, so, uh, digital banking licenses. It happens that in Southeast Asia there is a lot going on, but there is no such movement going on in Latin America or Africa. Will that affect or improve your yeah. endeavors? I think it's a good question, like uh, about banking licenses. I, like I can uh, take that based on the following. I'll just answer your question with another question. Uh, so in El Salvador, for example, Bitcoin is a currency, it's legal tender, right? So now you've got um, a, a Bitcoin license, and Bitcoin is a currency. So if you have a, a Bitcoin license in El Salvador, what kind of license is it? And then the answer is, it's like a banking license because Bitcoin is, is basically money. Um, so I think that many governments are regulating uh, crypto in a way, and especially when we get in, in a in, in crypto as legal tender, uh, that they are issuing banking licenses without actually knowing that they are doing it. I, I might add too that like, you know, the interesting thing about cryptocurrency is that it can be a lot of different things, especially as it relates to financial services, a commodity, uh, money remittance, a security, or a bank, right? All at the same, same time. And so I think a lot of that sort of decisioning is really relates to like, what are you or what's your core business that you're offering? And I think a lot of us too, um, like really focus on one aspect of that. Like if there's a world we play in, it's like money remittance, right? So we don't want to be a bank. So we have time for two more questions. Gentlemen up front. Uh, Hi. Um, first of all, I'm very excited to see everyone here. I think in the U.S., uh, people don't really think about what's going on outside the U.S., and this is really big business. Um, this week, uh, Argentina on one day 
um, had a couple of banks that were going to offer trading in, in BTC and, and ETH. And then uh, two days later, they got pinched by the IMF, and, and they're like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Um, what does that imply? When you think about government, what does it imply in terms of the take rate of the population really getting into crypto? Because I think banks, for better or worse, they give legitimacy to, okay, now I can do it without being a programmer, being a you know, custodian, yeah, I have my own custody, this sort of thing. What, what do you think it, it implies for, for people in, in Argentina or Latin America? <laughs> um, the, the only comment I have on this one, uh, you were accurate on, on your comment. It was a, a very sad situation in which uh, there, there were a couple of banks trying to, to offer crypto uh, adoption uh, and they got slammed by or affected by 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 a serious restriction. The the only obvious comment is that um, it's very hard to. I mean, innovation is happening, and it will happen, and it will happen faster if uh, if the the largest players in the economy. I mean, you were talking about the use cases, uh, the bank has a huge use cases. Uh, we are a large, very large e-commerce and, and also fintech platform there. So uh, if we can do crypto, uh, the use cases are pretty inf infinite. So uh, I obviously hope that, uh, that that regulation, I mean, I understand that, for example, they require KYC, which is a logical way from, from the standpoint stand from of a regulator, but I, I, I do hope that uh, that they won't block this marvelous solution uh, because it will harm the, the, the very same people they're trying to protect. Uh, I, the only thing I, I can say is that I, I hope they are a bit smarter than, than they have been so far. I think we have time for, me for one more question. Give it to Juliana. Yeah, so um, there was some questions, discussion earlier about uh, custodial versus non-custodial wallets. And I'm just curious if there are specific challenges that people in emerging markets might face, uh, especially stuff that we maybe wouldn't consider if we're coming from other parts of the world in terms of identity know, holding their own assets. I mean, I, I, well, A, there's the education of, you know, crypto keys and wallet and, you know, storage of that, but also identity in the case of like, okay, I lost it. How do I, do you identify yourself to access it? So it just, it's a customer service nightmare if you're, if that's part of your value proposition is a centralized entity. But, you know, I think another thing too, I, I wanted to elaborate on was um, the cat's out of the bag in terms of crypto currency on a global scale. and. I think if you've worked your whole entire life and now this country or this bank, you know, breaches your trust through some action, well, you're going to take action in your own hands and buy cryptocurrency even if the government disallows it. So you're seeing whether it's the, the US, Argentina, Nigeria, public uh, civil disobedience, you know, at a financial macro scale with this. And at the end of the day, that's what a revolution is, and that's what we need to change many of the systems to sort of reimagine what our financial futures look like. I wanted to, I'll add something on the uh, non-custodial versus custodial debate. And I, I totally agree with you, like, I, on, on the previous point. I think, you know, like, China has tried to ban crypto I don't know how many times. So, and, and that's an outright ban. It's not just, like, telling banks you can't offer this. And China is still kind of one of the countries with highest crypto uh, adoption and trading. So it's something that you, you I mean, it, there's a reason why one of the main features of crypto is that it's censorless. You, you can't stop it. So, you know, Argentina already has kind of one of the highest adoption, grassroots adoption of crypto. This is a shame, but I don't think it will stop growth uh, at all. Um, and on, on the non-custodial wallet, I think, yeah, I think it, it's a, a matter uh, of education, and I, and I agree with uh, with uh, what you you guys were saying before that 
um, th there is kind of a risk of, of losing keys, uh, but there are kind of technological solutions to this with smart wallets and social recovery. So, you know, we, we are on our way to, to a place where holding your own assets in a non-custodial wallet it becomes easy and, and not as risky as it is today where you have to kind of like write down a 12 uh, word phrase and, and so on. And I think that future is coming um, and it'll come with people kind of seeing the, the benefit of accessing all these different Web3 applications directly instead of in this kind of like walled gardens that you know some centralized applications um, offer. Uh, because like, okay, it starts with, I have a stable coin and, and maybe can earn a little bit of yield, but what if I, I can go and do some yield farming, or I can go and uh, put my NFT as collateral in this new uh, DeFi application, and it just like opens a whole new uh, financial system before you, if you can take control of your own on wallet. And I think that's that's kind of just a matter of time before. Uh, people in, in emerging markets see that. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely kind of stronger in, in the US and, and, and Europe. But, you know, if people kind of found a way to, to get to, you know, find uh, these uh, applications there, um, obviously in emerging markets it'll happen too. We have time for one more there. Um, quick. We're Uh, yeah, quick question. So, um, crypto and specifically blockchain technology allows for the creation of uh, new models, but it also allows for the delivery of services that was not cost effective to deliver before to be actually delivered to everybody. There are some basic services like life insurance that would, be, that would have been prohibitively expensive and they are needed especially by those who cannot afford them. Um, in your experience, what other services are, are going to be like offered at a much larger scale because of decreasing costs of delivery? So for me, you know, our, our vision and pain point that re we're really addressing, there are a lot of great last mile solutions. What cryptocurrency uh, addresses potentially, or the blockchain, are those last few inches. And you talk about life insurance, whether it's the payment of premiums the, uh, and payouts, right? If there are ways to you know, uh, validate that this is who they say they are, where they are, it can instantly happen with the satellite imagery. Um, you, know, you look at the, many of these distributed uh, or web two models um, that are predicated on this central intermediary, well, maybe I as a creator, I can now have this global P2P marketplace and I'm not paying 20, 30% for that facilitator anymore. So there's more money in my pocket, less friction, and hence driving, Im improving many emerging markets. Okay, guys, uh, we have to call it up now. I think we're <laughs> gonna get kicked out, but put your hands together for these amazing panelists.